a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Neil Johnson with you. It is the Thursday edition of 2020. We are in the deep end today. We're talking about legislation that's coming before our state parliaments and today on the latest developments taking down our nation's religious freedoms. Values and legislation that affect Christians and the church are firmly in the spotlight as we've been hearing in the state of Queensland and over this next hour more specifically although we'll talk about other states too a spotlight on New South Wales. The New South Wales government has introduced its Conversion Practices Ban Bill into Parliament yesterday. Our special guest today says it appears that the New South Wales government is trying to make a genuine attempt to keep its promises to faith communities. But there are concerns about the breadth of behaviours that the bill covers and the vague terms not well defined. Mike Southon is Executive Director of the organisation called Freedom for Faith. He's back with us again today. Freedom for Faith, activating the church to defend religious freedom. Uh, Welcome along, Mike. Good to have you back on 2020. Thanks, Neil. Thanks. It's great to be back. Uh, Mike, let's just talk about conversion therapy, the bill. Uh, Mm. There was a bill that was tabled in the New South Wales Parliament yesterday. Um, Give us some details so we understand what direction our conversation might be heading. Uh, well, so this is a bill that um, we can, we'll talk about the history. I think it would be important to, to talk about how we got here. But the bill that was tabled yesterday uh, has been the result of a ne- kind of negotiations between the government, uh, LGBTIQ advocates, uh, religious communities. And uh, it's frankly, it's not a great bill. Uh, it could be a lot better. It, but it also could be a lot worse. So our response is is a very mixed bag to this bill. Uh, it has got some significant problems, but it's also decidedly better than what we've seen in Victoria. Because what we've seen in some states is just a complete, uh, just uh, rolling over the church um, yes. and not listening to any uh, thought of amendments, uh, at least I think we might give some credit here to the men's government that appears to be giving some uh, intent to protect religious freedom. Uh, whether they're able to do that, that might be our question. But how do you see mm. Chris Minns and uh, the way that he might be trying in some ways to protect religious freedoms in New South Wales? I, again, I, I do think this is a, um, a genuine attempt to keep the promises that they made leading up to the election. It's an imperfect effort, uh, and as I said, there's um, significant problems. Uh, but I do believe that Chris Mintz himself uh, has been... Um, he, he's, he's caught between wanting to ban some things which he sees as being terrible behaviours, not knowing how to define those behaviours well in law, and also trying to protect religious freedom. Uh I'm not. I'm. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to talk about um, his motivation, but it does appear to be uh, a genuine effort. Although, as I said, there are some real problems. Uh, to stay on the positive for a moment, uh, because yes. it's easy to bash governments. Uh, some credit where they might be at least trying to uh, protect some of those freedoms that we have had historically. Uh, but this bill on banning gay conversion therapy um, apparently has these allowances made for parents and religious sermons. Uh, that's a couple of dimensions there. Perhaps doesn't cover a whole lot, but uh, but in some sense, uh, you know, if you're going along to church on Sunday, and I don't know that too many churches are actually preaching this sort of stuff from the pulpit, but at least there would be some protection for a religious sermon if it was around uh, those sorts of practices on conversion therapy. Any thoughts here about those intents to at least protect some elements? Yeah, and th- and there are some areas where the protections are quite good. Medical practitioners are in- completely carved out. So this, so if you are uh, as a psychologist is trying to treat somebody and deal with somebody, and there you are following all your standard professional and ethical requirements, this legislation doesn't make life any harder for you. Unlike what's been the case in other states, so that's an encouraging exception. Uh, there is also an exception for parents talking to their children, 
uh, we, we, we're not quite sure how far that talking, whether it goes to parents refusing to let their children do something. Uh, but there is there is an attempt to protect the conversation between parents and their children. Uh, and there is also um, exemption for what they say, a an expression, including in prayer, of a belief or principle, including a religious belief or principle, and an expression that a belief or principle ought to be followed or applied. So on the wording of it, you can say the Bible says that this is how... God wants us to live out our sexuality, and I believe you should follow this. So that is, it is clearly protected in um, in broader conversation, as you said, in sermons. That is um, clearly protected, but uh, we're not quite sure exactly how the wording of the legislation works when you get to an individual conversation. There does seem to be some protections But we're trying to work our way through that one at the moment. Well, the issue here, I suspect, is around this word and this practice that happens for Christians and in churches, and that is prayer and conversations. No doubt there'll be lots of listeners who've heard us had conversations now over the years about how prayer is being criminalized in some states because of the thought that you might be praying for someone and uh, inviting some sort of change to their uh, sexuality or uh, bringing the presence of God and the name of Jesus into uh, how you might align with a biblical identity. Uh, Any thoughts here around criminalising prayer? Would it go that far, the legislation in New South Wales? It might. Uh, So as I said, some of the wording is quite vague, uh, and there's an imprecision, particularly around how the idea of prayer interacts with the idea of suppression. Now, the legislation says you cannot suppress an individual's sexual orientation, and then it gives a protection around prayer, but it gives that protection so long as that prayer doesn't attempt to suppress their sexual orientation. So, at what point does expressing the belief that this is what the Bible says about sexuality— and I believe that you should you should live that way. And let's pray, Jesus. Let I ha- pray for my friend Bob that he could live faithful sexuality. At what point does that become a suppression practice? That's that is a real concern of ours about um, the the vagueness of these terms. Now, the LGBT activists who are pushing this bill, um, they are saying that uh, that. The bill would save lives because of all of those evil things that have gone on over the years. And uh, I'll get your thoughts here because uh, time and time again, uh, we have heard that none of the dreadful practices that are claimed to uh, be protected here have happened in this nation for generations. Um, And so uh, thoughts here about, you know, shock therapy and those sorts of things that are are, you know, form part of why people want to have these sorts of laws. Uh, but then it sort of graduates to uh, taking a bludgeon to the churches and criminalising prayer. Any thoughts here on the, the history and and the evil practices perhaps of the past that uh, supposedly, and I, I think this is where the evidence is, they don't happen anymore? Yeah, no, there is, I mean, there is no doubt that um, some terrible things happened in the past, as you said, like electric shock therapy and a, a aversion therapy and chemical treatments, and um, and they did cause significant psychological harm to some people. Uh, th- some of those people uh, undoubt- did commit suicide, and so stopping a practice like that, you could argue, will save lives. But as you said, there is no evidence these sorts of practices happen anymore. They've already been illegal under other forms of legislation. You, a doctor cannot do that anymore. A psychologist cannot do that anymore. Uh, the The campaign has moved to talking about persistent and, and the stories we, get, we are told, I should say, about from the lobbyists is um, a persistent bullying that would force somebody to, um, you know, you've got to change, you've got to change, or you're going to go to hell. You've got to change, you're going to go to hell. That, that sort of really persistent, almost coercive bullying um, is, is the story of what is claimed to be still happening. Now, again, I haven't seen any evidence that that actually does happen, and uh, no Christian church I know would treat any sinner that way because that's just not how you, how Jesus lives. Uh, so the, this is what is claimed that they're trying to prevent. 
uh, more than just the electric shock therapy. Uh, they, they are trying to prevent um, communities coercing people or something like that. Uh, it's hard for me to describe exactly what they're trying to protect because I'm not, I don't really fully get the concepts that they're working with. Uh, in some sense, you've got a positive peer pressure that happens within a Christian community and uh, there are expectations, aren't there? about yes. a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, uh, and, and and beyond that, a lifelong uh, commitment to one another so that there is that security for their raising of their children. All of that comes under attack, doesn't it? Because uh, yeah. what we understand about the godly family, a biblical understanding of a traditional family, that is under attack even as we speak. Well, absolutely. Um, and uh, the, the, the very premise of this legislation, as um, Chris Min says, is uh, that LGBTIQ people are not broken, do not need to be fixed. Now, that is problematic at the start because all people are broken and all people need to be fixed. And so if, if we want to be saying that LGBTIQ people are not any more broken than any other human being. All, all of us have got broken sexuality in one way or another. That's just what we know and what the Bible tells us. So if we want to say that everybody is equally broken in the eyes of God, I can go along with that. But if the legislation is trying to say, no, no, this category of people are actually, are in no way touched by a doctrine of sin, well then that, that is, that is impinging on uh, the very fundamental um, beliefs of not only Christianity, but every major world religion that says we're all broken and we all need God to be fixing us. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Absolutely. Yes, um, they don't like that word broken. Uh, yes. We say we're all broken and to jump out of uh, the camp that says we're all broken says we're not broken, we don't need fixing. The interesting thing is, and I'll get your thoughts here, because when someone from the LGBTQI community does want to change and the evidence is growing and there are so many testimonies now of people who have come through change uh, that this sort of legislation prohibits people from even seeking help to change. They become trapped in their own community lifestyle. Any thoughts here? Because, uh, you know, doctors are not allowed to tell their patients the truth. Counselors are not allowed to lead a questioning that will lead to a, a different outcome. Any thoughts here from you, Mike? Yeah, and you're absolutely right that there are whole areas of conversation that um, the church would traditionally have that are that that are being banned by this legislation. Uh, we are and churches who would want to pray for the um, pray for the the fundamental change of a person's heart so that they are no longer uh, attracted to the same sex. That that is expressly and explicitly banned in this legislation. That is exactly what is being targeted. What is more grey is um, rather than the difference between a conversion practice, which is trying to say, you are gay, I'm going to make you straight, and a suppression practice, or what they'll call a suppression practice, which is saying, you have same-sex attraction. You know you don't have to live or act on that. You can just live a faithful, celibate life in service of Jesus uh, and so the question is, is that in itself an illegal practice now? And unfortunately, the legislation is just a little vague on that. Mike, uh, when we talk about uh, things like a conversion practices ban bill, I wonder mm. if you've got any reflection about how we got to this point, because for some, they'll think this is extreme. But how did we get here? Yeah, and it is really important for us to uh, remember how we got here, because a couple of years ago, uh, Victoria legislated an incredibly harsh conversion practices bill that, uh, that did express, expressly ban pretty much all forms of prayer around sexuality, expressly banned conversations, expressly banned encouraging someone to live celibately. And that was the pattern that had been laid down. In fact, in other countries around the world who have been debating conversion therapy, uh, advocates have held up the Victorian legislation as the worldwide gold standard. 
And so that's where we were a couple of years ago in a, um, a rapid trajectory to thoroughly banning any Christian expression about sexuality uh, and gender and how we are to live out our lives in sexuality uh, to the glory of God. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When we were leading up to the New South Wales election last year, uh, they, the, um, the, the issue started coming into the election. The independent MP, Alex Greenwich, made it very clear that banning conversion practices was a requirement of his support for any government. And we, we, we were looking like we were walking into an election that was going to create a minority government. And indeed, that's what did happen. Our Labor government is a minority. And uh, it looked like Alex Greenwich would be the kingmaker. And he was asking for legislation like Victoria. And that was his requirement. So as we were moving up to the election, a lot of churches held candidate forums. These are incredibly valuable opportunity to um, get a whole lot of Christians into a room, invite the candidates for that electorate, and ask them a few questions about what are they going to do about certain issues. Uh, Freedom for Faith, we helped churches run those candidate forums. Uh, and at the, in the end, there were more than a third of electorates in New South Wales had a church holding a candidate forum, and almost all of them asked candidates, what are you going to do about conversion therapy? Are you going to protect prayer? Are you going to protect preaching? Are you going to use the Victorian model, or are you going to do something better? So that opportunity to ask the questions at during an election actually resulted in the major parties making commitments. And so Chris Minns actually made commitments saying, and I'll quote, neither the Greenwich Bill or the Victorian model will be the starting point of our legislation. Any vet legislation to ban conversion therapy must not outlaw individuals seeking out medical health or other assistance and assistance according to their personal circumstances and other uh, MPs committed to not banning people consensually requesting support through prayer. That, so that was a wonderful set of promises that we got. Now, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but a real step backward from the trajectory that we had in Victoria. And so those promises is what we are what we've been relying on and calling the government to uphold in the past year as we've been waiting for them to write their legislation. Now, Alex Greenwich brought up his legislation proposal, which was pretty much a cut and paste of Victoria and had all the dangers of Victorian legislation. Uh, the Department of Communities and Justice, you may recall, in about August released their recommendations, which pretty much were a cut and paste of Victoria and all the vulnerabilities of Victoria. And so we looked in a pretty bad situation. Every recommendation was to replicate the Victorian model. And since then, a lot of people have written to their MP. You and I have talked about this campaign to write to your MP and just lovingly and carefully express your concerns about this legislation. And MPs kept telling me, oh boy, we're hearing, we're getting these letters. And in that loving but firm campaign that we've run, we have managed to be negotiating with the government, moving fr them from that starting point of Victoria to carving out these exemptions. So it's the bill is, as I keep saying, there are serious problems with the bill. And I'm, I'm worried about a number of things that it, it could potentially ban. But it's also been the result of starting from a standing start a year ago with a commitment effectively to Victoria's model. And we've got it to a dramatically improved no way in near perfect or good, but a dramatically improved bill. We're taking calls, 1-800-316-316. You might like to make a contribution or ask a question around our conversation today as we're talking about New South Wales. Let's take a call. Tim is in Red Bank in Queensland, I'm assuming. Hey, Tim, welcome along. Uh, G'day, Neil. i Creek, mate, near Esk in Queensland. Oh, near Esk. Yep, so, great. Yeah, so... I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what you're talking about this morning and I can't talk to the New South Wales uh, things. I'm not, I'm not sort of over what's happening there, but in regards to what they're trying to do in Queensland, I just think well, the government's putting so much energy into discussing what Christian schools do. Now, yep. I, I'm, I'm drawn to, the, to thinking, what, are the, what is the government not focusing on? You know, they're, 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 they're sort of putting all their energy into sticking their nose into Christian's business in the Christian school system 
And you've already highlighted the, or your other guest highlighted that a lot of people are choosing to send their children to Christian schools just for other reasons other than Christian influence. But, you know, we've got a government in Queensland here who, at the, with the stroke of a pen, just decided to end all the state forest, native state forest logging, you know. And that was just, it went through under people's eyes. No one batted an eyelid. It's going to destroy so many businesses and livelihoods of Queenslanders, yet it, it, it has no media coverage. It, it has, people don't even know what's going on. And all the while, I could give you so many other <laughs> examples of Tim, what the government you're making doing good sense here, today. and uh, I don't think Mike was listening to our earlier conversation about Queensland schools, although I'm sure, Mike, you'll be across the general sorts of things that we would have been talking about so far as Absolutely. Uh, developments there. Uh, but yep. Tim's making some very good points here, and, uh, and he's yep. talking about Queensland where there is no upper house, no house of mm. review, and so, therefore, if a majority of members uh, vote one way on a piece of legislation, it just basically becomes law and uh, at least in New South Wales and other states you've got some upper house review yes. of legislation that passes but what are your thoughts here for Tim? Oh Tim well um, first uh, I was I flew up to Brisbane last weekend um, and I've been meeting with um, heads of churches up there and a number of other groups and uh, yeah, we we are heavily involved in the d- discussion around the Queensland anti discrimination legislation as well, uh, and we are the the sorts of things that we've done in New South Wales, including mobilising thousands of people to write to their MP, uh, thinking very hard about how we can have a strong e- uh, election campaign. Uh, you've got one in October. And uh, we have already committed to helping the churches in Queensland run an election forum in every electorate in Queensland, 93 electorates that we're working towards. But this legislation right now, you're, you're absolutely right. It's terrible legislation. It's also terribly written. Uh, the second half of it seems to be directly contradicting what the first half of it says. Uh, and uh, it seems to have been very hastily put together while they're trying to deal with a whole lot of other things. I think the government is um, is quite confused at the moment in Queensland and what they're trying to do. And um, I, I, you're not wrong. Uh, it's, this isn't something that they should be dealing with, trying to rush through just before an election in October. It seems mad. Tim at Red Bank, thank you so much for your call. Let's take another call just very quickly before news. Let's hear from Eugene in Perth, WA. Hey, Eugene, need to be very quick. What were your thoughts? Um, my thoughts on conversion therapy in New South Wales, I guess it all starts from... Um, I don't think government should be the primary person to be at fault because I think that um, uh, if we guard our children from home and parents take take back the authority by by providing um in, influence over the children in terms of the biblical values and teaching, then the problem wouldn't erupt it from home into schools and ran from schools in the community and the community into the government. Mike Southon, before the news we took a call, Eugene was expressing some concerns about parents. I wonder if, uh, and I, you know, it was just before news, we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, Eugene was making some important points. I uh, didn't like to cut him off uh, too early because we were going to news, but what were your thoughts around parents and how you might respond for Eugene? Yeah, well, as uh, a lecturer at my Bible college says that, um, you know, family is your first church. And as Eugene was saying, that parents are fundamental in um, training our young people to live godly lives. Now, we, we need to protect the right of parents to be able to teach their kids what is good and what is right. And the simple fact is that is not protected in Victoria. The Victorian legislation has got... Uh, it does it has no exemptions for parents. If a parent would say to a child, no, I'm not going to let you do this or live that way because it's against what our family believes, that would in Victoria be uh, a change or a suppression practice. If it, so in New South Wales, there has been an attempt by the government to give protections to parents. Now, the exemption actually says 
what is exempted is parents discussing matters relating to sexual orientation, gender identity, sexual activity, or religion with their children. That's a good protection, but then when you ask the question, what about parents disciplining their children? And I don't mean beating them, but, but the, no, you cannot do that. I will not allow you to do that. This is how we live, sort of um, good discipline that a parent gives, is, doesn't seem to be quite as expressly protected in this legislation. So, again, an attempt at an at a, a exemption, but still some concerns. Okay, I know there'll be some listeners who'll be thinking, oh, really, is this already the law in Victoria where you say in Victoria there is no right even for parents to have those conversations with their own children and teenagers? Um, That's confronting, isn't it? But that's what we've been dealing with now for a number of years where in Victoria this legislation was rammed through and it basically criminalises parents and Christians for being a, wanting to shape the values of their own children. Uh, thoughts mm. there that, uh, you know, that it actually is very extreme in Victoria and I guess if it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't go through with some sort of amendments or cautionary uh, ways that these things are presented, then this could be on the way for New South Wales. Thoughts from you, Mike? Yeah, well, again, the, the, extreme, the extreme nature of um, Victoria is not what's going to land in New South Wales, but still some very significant concerns. But in Victoria, the um, Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission has got a website that you can look up, which gives you all the things you are allowed to do and all the things you are not allowed to do. Uh, it's a special website just for religious organisations. And they've got a section on prayer. And they have comments that you know, praying for somebody to live celibately is unlawful. They, and then they also list some fun thing. It's a great site that tells you what you are allowed to pray for. You're allowed to pray for inner peace. You're allowed to pray for guidance for that person. You, you can pray a prayer that affirms that the person is made in their God's image perfect as they are. Those are the government-authorized prayers that you are given in Victoria. Now, I mean, that's slightly extreme. Obviously, they're not saying those are the only three things you can pray for. But the way that they are dictating, you may not pray for this, you may not pray for this, this is acceptable, this is acceptable, it's, it's just an extreme approach in Victoria. It's horrifying. It does sound like tyranny. Uh, it does yes. sound like a absolutist uh, idea of trying to... Uh, stamp out those things that might be seen as being um, uh, subversive. Uh, mm. This is the way Christians are being seen, do you think? I mean, when you get to this legislation, this is when you get to talk about this, uh, cr- Christians being framed as subversive peoples, uh, challenging what a government might tell you is the values and morals that you must live by. Well, I think the thing that we are um, we are evil and subversive against is not the government per se, but the ideology that sexuality is the is the sole definition of who I am. My sexuality is sacrosanct. I get to define what my sexuality is, and any challenge to that. Uh, is challenging the fundamental nature of who I am, is a violation of my human rights and therefore should be illegal. And it is the fact that the church for 2,000 years has challenged the sexual mores of our society. Just read 1 Corinthians and see how hard it pushes against the sexual assumptions of the, early, of, of the um, ancient Near East. But um, but so that is what we are bad people for. We are bad people for saying there is a right way and a wrong way to live our sexuality. Uh, what's happening in Victoria? Because there's already legislation there uh, around those issues of conversion practices. Um, mm. How does the government deal with that? I mean, uh, are we thinking that there are cases before the courts, uh, that there are people who are being dragged off to jail? Uh, what's actually happening in Victoria? How do they enforce what they now have in, in legislation? Yeah, um, I am not aware of anybody who's been um, fallen foul of the criminal uh, case, statutes and is in, is currently in the courts or likely to have, um, be dragged in front of jail. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of that so far happening in Victoria. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen, uh, but it doesn't seem to have happened yet. Um, there have been cases that I'm aware of where the um, uh, Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission have 
contacted people and notified them that their behavior is a suppression practice and that what they're doing is illegal. And so it's that, that initial light touch saying, you're doing this thing, which is pretty much um, standard Christian behavior. You're doing this thing. It's illegal. Don't do it. That's what I'm aware of at the moment that's happening, but that's not the danger right at this point in time. The danger is what is going to happen in 20 years' time? So these things have been classed as illegal. The church is doing its best to live by the law, but also live faithfully under Christ. A young man, if I'm a minister in Victoria, a young man comes to me and says, I'm married, but I have these other um, homosexual urges. Can you help me? I want to stay faithful to my wife. Can you pray for me? Uh, that very example was presented to um, the Victorian government um, in inquiries, and they specifically said, nope. You cannot encourage people to, to stay within their marriage. That would be a suppression practice. Now, what if I do that? What if I say, no, no, mate, you've got to stay married. You've got to stay married. You've made these commitments to your wife. This is what God wants you to do. And then 20 years later, he comes back and says, what you did was a suppression practice. You have harmed me irreparably. Where's my $2 million? That's the real fear that comes out of the Victorian legislation. It's not going into prison today. It's what's going to come down the line as people claim that what would have been normal Christian practice is now illegal, harmful, and deserving of, of massive um, amounts of money. So what that does is that's got a chilling effect on our speech. We, we self-censor. We think, I'm not sure if this is going to put me in danger uh, in 20 years' time, so maybe I won't say it. And, and you get, start getting guidelines coming out of ch churches suggesting this is how you manage these situations. This is what you do. And, and it's a, a sense, it's fear. And you, you mentioned the dictatorship. Well, it is genuinely Orwellian fear. Oh, it, we have been having, we're having words, phrases, and concepts not made explicitly illegal, but we self-censor because we're afraid of what's going to come down the line. Uh, it's genuinely, oh, I've said it before, it's horrifying. So we self-censor, and that means yeah. that people who are leading denominations uh, and uh, they'll make directives to Bible colleges that are raising up new ministers of the gospel. They'll be sending out directives to the churches where there are pastors and there are priests and there are elders and there are people who might be involved in the pastoral ministry of church. And they will say, these are the new regulations that you are able to do according to our government. Um, that's, again, sounding like the sort of tyranny, but that's the way it sort of filters down, isn't it, into uh, church life or into the school settings, maybe into the aged care facilities, maybe into the child care facilities. In fact, there's so much in the church that will be affected. Uh, it just filters down into that because of legislation. Yes, because of that fear. And, and I, I want to reinforce that I have got the deepest respect for our faith leaders who are trying to navigate an incredibly difficult situation. And different denominations are going to land in different places uh, in, their, in their guidance to their ministers. So um, I we just want to be very careful that um, I'm not, I don't live in Victoria. I don't have to deal with this. And I've got utmost respect for everybody who's trying to figure out how to deal with this situation uh, in their particular circumstances. And describing it a little bit like sleeper legislation, a uh, little bit like a mine that's planted in the fields and decades along, it can go off and uh, those sorts of things can affect uh, the things that you do in your Christian walk, in your Christian ministry over the years ahead. We could talk a lot about this, but I know that there's a whole lot of things that you've been dealing with. And in fact, let's talk about the Equality Bill, because mm. while we're talking about those things that are to do with uh, this topic of conversion practices bans, um, there's this other uh, bill, which is a very all-encompassing one and comes from the same source, the Equality Bill. What's happened to that? Because there was even the possibility that there could have been a vote in the New South Wales Parliament today, but there's been a, a little bit of a stay on that. What's happened? Yeah, well, until tomorrow, in, until yesterday morning, uh, the standing orders of Parliament had scheduled this bill to be debated, and a guaranteed vote was set for today. Now they've um, they've changed that, and I'll get back to that in a second. But what is the bill? The Equality Bill is an 80-page bill that makes. Uh, 
huge number of changes to legislation across the board. Um, it's, it's actually hard to get uh, um, a, a clear description of what the Equality Bill does because it tries to do so many things. It um, has legislative changes around prostitution. It's got changes around... Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, my words have escaped me for a second. Uh, it changes anti-discrimination legislation uh, and, uh, and, and strips, rips away most religious organisations, including schools, abilities to employ based on living out your faith in sexuality. Uh, it um, criminalised various kinds of speech. It, it's just a horrifying, large and complicated bill. I said 80 pages. It's actually 50 pages. It's got 80 changes in it um, to 20 bits of legislation. So this is a massive omnibus bill, hugely complicated, um, changing all sorts of things. It was supposed to be debated today and voted on today. The government uh, has been receiving, again, quite a lot of emails about this. And we have been encouraging, and you and I have talked about this, contacting your MP, telling them that you're concerned about this bill. And this is a great example of how effective that strategy is. Again, I talked to MPs on both sides of the aisles, all of them saying, we've been getting these emails. We've been getting lots of these emails. A couple of them saying, this is the issue I get the most emails about on a weekly basis. The government have recognized how complicated this bill is. Uh, they have made a commitment to independence that they will not just cancel in legislation that independents bring up. Fair enough. They said we're going to have to take this bill seriously. Fair enough. But what they've done now is they've extended the legislation to August and they have moved the bill to a committee and they are going to be looking at the bill bit by bit, detail by detail about what, what they can accept, what they can't accept. And this is our opportunity to continue talking with the government, continue negotiating with them and saying, these parts of the bill are abhorrent. You cannot let this through. In fact, most of the bill is abhorrent. There's very little which is an acceptable in this bill. So you have the equality bill, and let's call yes. it the big bad bill, all right, because there's so yes. many dimensions. It is. Is there yes. something that you perceive in the strategy that all of a sudden a New South Wales Parliament is debating debating the conversion bill? Is that uh, is it a possibility that that's going to take all the oxygen out of the debate around the equality bill? Is there something here you think might be happening behind the scenes? There's a strategy to push this through without much debate. Actually, I actually feel like it's kind of the opposite. Uh, if they wanted to push the bill through without debate, they could just vote on it today. They had, this, they had the framework to shove it through. Uh, so what instead I think is going on is they, they have, have recognised that this bill is going to be disastrous. Uh, and I think they're using the de current debate about conversion therapy to get away with delaying it longer so that we could have more of a conversation. I actually see this as a positive. They're understanding that this bill is way too complicated and way too... Uh, too many people oppose it to let it through. So we need to take the time. And at the same time, they can bring up their conversion therapy legislation to try and get themselves some brownie points. Is it possible that it would only be disastrous if Christians do nothing, say nothing, don't speak up and don't point out the things that could be wrong with this bill? Uh, what are your thoughts here for the Christian community? And I'm not talking about the church leaders uh, I'm talking mm. about ordinary people who are listening to our conversation today, uh, ordinary mums and dads. Um, disaster waiting to happen here if you do nothing, say nothing. Absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned church leaders. I love my archbishop dearly, but we've gone past the days when an archbishop walks into a premier's office and has any impact on legislation whatsoever. What we need, as you said, is every Christian, every mum and dad, everybody writing in to their local MP and saying, we are really concerned about this legislation. And it works. And we can prove it works because, as we've seen, this equality bill was brought up was supposed to be debated and passed today, 
And because we stood up and we spoke out, it has been delayed. Now, we're not going to go to sleep. We're going to continue standing up and we're going to continue speaking out. And over the next week or two, as we see the shape of the committee, we're going to have more suggestions about who to write to and how to write to keep them aware of our concerns. But the most powerful force in Australian politics is individual people contacting their MP directly and saying, I am worried. And one of the most powerful groups who could do that is the church. And voting Christians, concerned Christians, uh, bringing the fear of God into the corridors of power. Uh, that's, yes. uh, that's pretty important. And it's one of those things we've been talking about for years on this program, the way that oftentimes as Christians, when it comes to casting our ballot at the polling booth, uh, we're not voting according to our Christian conscience. Somehow or other, we're just swept along by whatever advertising has captured our imagination, which just brings me to a, a final point because uh, Tasmania has got a state election coming up and uh, just Isn't over it? a week away, and uh, you've got some candidates' forums that are planned, and these have been organised in conjunction with churches in Tasmania. A quick little update on how those look. Yeah, uh, so uh, we've had candidate, a candidate forum ran last night. Um, a couple of forums are running today. Uh, each of these forums are being live streamed or recorded. So you can go onto our website, meetyourcandidates.org.au, to find out about the candidate forum around you. Uh, the last forum that's going to be held is going to be the one for Lyons, which is a big, widely distributed electorate. It's going to be live streamed. It's next Monday, and I strongly encourage all your Tasmanian listeners to, to check out the website meetyourcandidates.org.au find the forum that's near to them we've got a couple tonight we've got another one tomorrow we've got another one Monday evening now is the time to hear what your candidates in this election are going to say because conversion therapy legislation is a live conversation in Tasmania as well it is. It's alive everywhere. And for those Tasmanian listeners, meetyourcandidates.org.au and all of the other things that we've been talking about this past hour, freedomforfaith.org.au and you'll be able to get an overview of what we've been talking about with the conversion uh, issue. And uh, there'll be updates that are issued as they happen. Um, Mike Southon is the executive director of the organization called Freedom for Faith. And they're looking to activate the church to defend religious freedom. Uh, that's a challenge, isn't it? Because if we do nothing, uh, then there'll be a railroading of legislation. There'll be a steamrollering over Christian values and our families will suffer the consequences. Freedomforfaith.org.au uh, Mike, always great getting an insight from you and uh, from uh, your team there at Freedom for Faith. Thank you so much for taking some time to share your thoughts with us today on 2020. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.